Oh, hi, hello. <laughs>
And she was last seen alive after she went over to Michael Skakel's home and his brother, Tommy, they had a big, huge house. Um, and she was last seen there at their home across the, across the street from her home. And I mean, it was just, you know, walking distance across the street in a place called Bell Haven, which is where all the rich people are. Um, Michael Skakel was also 15 at the time. And no one was uh, charged with this crime for almost d decades. Um, and he was convicted in 2002 of murdering Moxley, Martha Moxley, and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. In 2013, Skakel was granted a new trial by a Connecticut judge who ruled the counsel, his counsel had been inadequate. And then he was released on a $1.2 million bond, uh, bail, sorry. Uh, and then in 2016, so he was out for like three years, the Connecticut Supreme Court ruled to reinstate his conviction. So, and then, and then again in 2018, they ordered a new trial. Then two years later in 2020, just recently, so we're talking half a year, uh, almost a year ago now, October 2020, the state of Connecticut announced it would not retrial Michael Skakel for Moxley's murder. And that's very interesting. And we'll find out exactly, you know, why, why that didn't happen. Hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of people are shocked when that occurred. They're like, how in the heck is this possible? How in the heck? So at any rate, uh, oh, somebody, uh, Claire Merrick, hi, good to see everybody. Um, oh, Jody Arias, we'll talk, we, that's on the list, Evelina, uh, it's on the list. So people are putting, uh, when you, when you come here, you can put things you would like me to, you know, address in another video and. Jody Arias is on the list. And so you can always ask and I will try to get it on the list. So now, why in the world, after all this time, after he spent oh, 11 years in prison, did Michael Skakel is now free and he's not going to be retried? Why would that be? And the real reason that it is to be not happening a retrial is because the prosecution decided there wasn't enough evidence to convict him. So now you ask, how did he get convicted the first time? <laughs> and I will tell you how he got convicted the first time. And it's a, this is a whole, uh, what do you want to call it? a parade of the media and Hollywood and writers and people who have a lot of interest and not so much justice as they are in money. And that's an unfortunate thing because when we get people out here who are interested in other things, this is what causes the problem because we're not having the police department um, uh, investigating the case and coming up with enough evidence to convict. We're coming up with pressure from the public coming in on whomever is then, uh, you know, whoever's the prosecutor's office at that time, pushing them to convict somebody, even if there isn't enough evidence. Now, there was a reason that they did not prosecute anybody for all those years. And that the reason was, there was not enough evidence to convict anyone. And I will show you exactly why that's true and how this is a travesty that he ended up being convicted. Whether you think he did it or not, there was never any evidence to put him in prison. Uh, and it's, it's shocking. Uh, and my contention will be there were two better suspects than Michael Skakel. And if you're going to put somebody away, why would you put one of the two better suspects away with the better evidence? And why would you put him away? So, so the problem comes down to not basing our our uh, determinations on evidence, but on emotions and oh, that's weird or whatever we're going to base it on. And I will explain to you how this got so out of hand over the years. Um, one point thing I want to point out is one of the biggest mistakes ever made by the Skakel family was hiring a group called. Uh, they, they were the Suttons. Uh, they, were, they were private investigators, retired law enforcement. They're called, I think they're called the Sutton Group. And they, um, Michael Skakel's dad hired these guys because he said, look, our name is being dragged through the mud. My, my sons have been, you know, well, at that time, mostly uh, Michael's older brother, Tommy, who was two years older than him. And he was the number one suspect at some point. Uh, and, and the father was like, you know, hey, let me, let me just hire somebody so we can clear their names. And if for some reason it turns out to be one of my kids, so be it. And I'll just provide a good defense. Now, a lot of people find that very upsetting. I find that extremely good character, actually, because 
he wanted to, you know, one way or the other, he was willing to go with it. Um, and so he hired this, this group and they wrote the Sutton Report, which I think is one of the most abysmal things I have ever read. And let me tell you what happens sometimes with private investigators. You make a lot of money doing private investigation. And the longer you carry on the investigation, the more money you make. You know, uh, a, a low level private investigator may be 50 bucks an hour. High level, ooh, you know, you get up to 100, 200, whatever, $300 an hour. And the more people you can interview, <laughs> the more you can drag it out, the more money you make. And I read the Sutton Report and it was full of a whole bunch of gobbledygook, to tell you the truth. A whole bunch of this guy said that and this guy said that. And not, not, there's no, there was no absolute, you know, this, this is what was made under oath. And this was what was made during a police interview. It's just a lot of, a lot of stuff. And on top of that, what they did was they included in it, um, a, they, from the FBI, uh, the retired FBI, there's a group called the, um, they're called the Academy Group. They're retired FBI guys. And they wrote a profile for this crime, which was really weird because it was like painted onto Michael Skakel and maybe Tommy Skakel, but painted on. Nothing from the crime scene tells me these things that they put here. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. What weird things they put in here, which I'm like, you could not get that from a crime. So you're just making that up. Oh, you know how you're making that up? You, you have decided who did it. And then you're going to add these things to it because it's, it's nonsense. I mean, absolute nonsense uh, and frightening to me because first of all, profiles should be based solidly on evidence. And if you can't base it on that evidence, you shouldn't be making up stuff about age or behavior or all kinds of weird things, which you don't know. You simply do not know. And I'll explain that to you after I show you the basic crime scene. <laughs> so the Kennedy, I'm not sure what that means. The Kennedy, the Kennedy, Kennedy Cruz. Well, here's the point that, you know, these guys were, were connected to the Kennedy. So this was a very high profile bunch of people. And if you're going to make money off of somebody, you better point at somebody who's got you know, who's very, very famous. It's not somebody who's just a loser down the block. And I'll explain more about that as well. Okay, let's take a look at the at the actual crime scene. And I'll explain it very quickly. And I'll show you how ridiculous some of this stuff is. It's just unbelievable. So here we have, okay, first of all, Bell Haven area, very rich, beautiful homes. Nobody was poor. And one of the things they've done, which is really strange in this case, is that they made out that the Skakels, when they wanted the media doing this and the writers, the Skakels were like repulsively rich. They could control everything. And they made out the Moxleys to be like the poor neighbor. The Moxleys were not poor people. They, they could afford to live in this place. They were not poor. So maybe they weren't as rich as the Skakels, but to, to say that they, they were nobodies is ridiculous because Mr. Moxley had a fi very fine job and, and they could afford to live here and they played golf too. So, you know, it, it's just, it, it appalls me that you're going to make this an issue over money and power as opposed to evidence. So that's where they live. Now let's take a look at just the basic crime scene. Okay, so it's, it's maybe a little hard to see here, but over here is just showing you that up here is this, this is the Skakel house up here. And basically when, when, when Martha Moxley left that night, she just, she, she was, the whole story goes like this. If you haven't heard it. So summer, so Martha and her was over at the Skakel house with 15 year old Michael Skakel and his brother, Tommy, who I think is 17. Um, and they're hanging out and supposedly they're all getting the car to listen to music. And this is right about nine 30 at night. And Michael's in the back seat. And then Tommy jumps in the front seat next to Martha. And there's some statement over how he's touching her leg and she's going, no, no, stop, stop. And then, then they decide they're going to go to visit some other people and they're going, so they say they're going to leave. And so Tommy jumps out and Martha jumps out. Um, Martha supposedly, because she has like a 10 o'clock curfew. So, but they jump out and off goes with the car with Michael Skakel in it and his cousins and whoever else off to someplace. And they're going to watch some Monty Python thing at somebody's house. Meanwhile, Martha and, and, and Tommy are supposedly right about here about this. The, there's a swimming pool up here and there's like near the swimming pool. They're like kissing. The story originally was they like just kissed and, and rolled around a bit. And, um, and later on, Tommy supposedly said, Oh, they had a little bit more, like a little bit more finger play than he had originally admitted. Uh, and then after that, supposedly 
Martha, who's up here at the swimming pool, leaves that house and she walks just down here across the street into her house is like right here. So it's the drive is right here. So we're talking about like a, gosh, I don't know, minute, a minute walk. I mean, we're talking close. So she walks down there and she gets assaulted right about here. And over here is just the Henry, uh, this was, no, this was the original um, kind of layout. So here's, this is the driveway and she's coming up here and supposedly she gets attacked about here. That's what Henry Lee thinks. And then she starts running. Whoops, the wrong way. She starts running. I can't get it right. She starts, it's hard to do with a green screen. You don't have a pointer. She runs over here and she gets attacked there. That's where she's basically beaten to death and with a with the golf club. And then eventually, well, let's see if I can get my hand to do it. I can't, you know, it's almost impossible. Oh, there it is. Then she gets dragged over to the street. From here, she gets dragged, 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 dragged up to the street. Okay, that's basically it. And there's the tree she has left underneath. So let me see if I can get you a better picture of the, the crime scene. Okay, so here we have again, we have, this is kind of where everything happens. You can see right above my shoulder, it says attack begins in the driveway here. And then let's see, attack, oh yeah, here's in the driveway. And then this is the major attack site over here. And then she gets dragged up to the tree. So it's kind of like that. She's coming from down here. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Oh, who is that? Boom. And she gets attacked and then she runs. And then she gets beaten to death. And then as she's dragged up here. Okay, that's basically it. And it's not really as important as people want to make out all the details of this at this point in time. I just want you to understand the basics of it. Uh, what is she beaten with? She is beaten with a golf club that is later identified as coming from the, from the Skakel household. It belongs to a set in the Skakel household. And this is actual, what you call evidence, not just conjecture, evidence. And Three parts of the, the um, golf club are found there. One is this one, which is the one found under her body. And over here you have these two pictures is where they kind of flew. A piece of that broke off and flew and the, the head broke off and flew like away, way far away. And then the head, the, the, the grip of the, the uh, golf club is missing. And suppose that was what supposedly stabbed through her neck. I'll show you what supposedly happened to her head. Okay, so here, over here, we see she's, um, she was hit like, there's, she was hit four times, three times like that, and then, I'm sorry, four times, four times, one doing real bad damage here. So basically, whack, 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 whack. And then this part here, they're showing over there, is just where she laid on, she laid on the, uh, on one of the pieces of this, the one underneath that one right there, where she laid on it. So there she gets, she gets whacked a lot. Um, it's really interesting. I tried to find a copy of the autopsy on the internet and I don't know where it is because I couldn't find one copy of the autopsy. I got little pieces of opinion from Henry Lee and a piece of opinion from Furman and a piece. And I'm like, where the heck is the actual total autopsy? And I, I still don't know the answer to that. Very, very frustrating. Um, there is a part in the Sus Sutton report that says she was also punched. Her nose was broken and her eyes had, you know, they were basically orbits were bruised. Boom, boom. Somebody punched her out right in the face. So that's interesting. That's an important piece of this whole thing, because one of the questions is, why did this uh, attack start and how did it start, start and who would have done that kind of thing to her? So anyway, this is basically what happened to Martha Moxley. Now, the question is, who done did it? OK, and some very interesting points come up about who would have done this. And, and let me point, point, point some of those out to you. Oh, oh, by, uh, here's a good point. I can't imagine the force it would take to break a golf club on someone's body. We don't know that actually happened. There's two possibilities. One is, I, I'm gonna show you in a bit. I did, I did this, um, this oxygen. I did a show called Murder and Justice in the case of Martha Moxley. By the way, last show I ever did on for a documentary because I was so pissed after I did it um, because I left out so much of what I said and it, it was very frustrating. But during that show, the one thing I will give credit to is that there was a demonstration done where maybe you know she took the golf club and the host of the show and she slammed it on a cement floor and it didn't break. And you're like, well, if it didn't break there, how did it end up flying? Two pieces end up flying so far away. And Henry Lee's belief was, that when he was hitting her, when he hit her and then came back like this, that had already weakened it. And somehow then it, this, this centrifugal force or something tossed it and it broke apart because of that. Uh, maybe true. I, I would have to 
test that all out with a bunch of golf clubs, which I don't own and I don't really want to do right now. But if I were working the case, that's called crime scene reconstruction. And I love crime scene reconstruction because then I act out exactly what happened to see if it could have happened that way. I probably would have gone and found a whole bunch of very cheap golf clubs, but of the same size. Uh, it was a ladies golf club. Make sure it's the same length. And then test it out by beating it on floors and by smashing it and going like this and seeing how it would break apart. Because I would want to know that if I were going to do a full profile, a full crime scene analysis. But it, it's a good question whether it broke because the, 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 during the hitting and pulling that it came apart or as was shown in this uh, the oxygen show that the person put the golf club, you know, the head of the golf club down on the ground and stepped on the shaft of it, which does break it really pretty easily. So, cause he wanted maybe the stabbing thing. So if he stepped on it, he could then break it and stab with it. Um, and she was stabbed then through, through the neck. Uh, interesting enough, the, 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 the implement, which, which is the, where, where you hold the, uh, the uh, golf club, that part, which was about 20 inches long, about this, about this long, stabbed through her neck and either the person pulled it out and took it away or, this is a claim that was made, and I'm just not buying this one. Some couple people said, oh, I saw I saw that in her neck, but it disappeared. Uh, Mark Fermo would have you believe that either the police were crooked enough to pull that out of her neck and get rid of it, or it was removed for evidence and got lost. I'll believe the second one, the lost one, before I think it, somebody purposely took that out of her neck. It doesn't make sense. But also, a, a number of other people say they never saw anything in her neck, and they were on the scene right at the beginning. So I'm not sure that people's minds just didn't imagine things over time. Um, so the question can be, if that person did that, maybe they knew they needed to get rid of the, the name on here because that was clearly linked to the, uh, the Skakel's house. So you'd want to get rid of that particular piece of evidence. Now, let's take a look at that. Let's look at, let me look at a couple, couple of, I want to show you a couple little, um, first of all, I just want to, I forgot to do this one, which I just like. The Moxleys do deserve their pound of flesh. It just isn't me. Okay, it just isn't me. I forgot. Perhaps hold on a second here. Oh, but sometimes it's so hard to manage this stuff here when you're doing things live. Uh, I wanted to be able to show you can see. He said, oh, they can have their pound of flesh. It's just not me. So, I, I which if he didn't do it, He's still commiserating with the Moxley saying, hey, you deserve justice, but hey, if it's not me, it's not me. But now let's look at what Mrs. Moxley says, which I find very, very interesting. And I will explain how this all works out. I say that's why I think there was someone else there. He was in a frenzy, I think, and he couldn't, he couldn't put all that together. But I think that whoever came and helped him was the cooler head. Who did you think that was? Uh, I don't know. You know, I heard voices that night. I think that's when this all happened. It didn't sound just like one, two voices. It sounded like a little group. Okay, so very interesting statement. So the question is, how many people were at the scene? Was it one person, two people, three people? Okay. There are, there are two possibilities if you're looking at this. The first possibility is this, and this came up way, way later. Uh, let me find this. And this is, would be true even if, if um, let me see if I can find him. Okay, this guy, <laughs> this was the most bizarre thing ever. Years, years, years later, Tony Bryant um, <laughs> uh, of uh, sports fame came forth and said two buddies of his came up from the Bronx at that time two decades ago and they said they wanted to grab a girl and then do caveman stuff on her okay uh so we have these two friends now there's two problems here i'm going to show you the two problems at the same time first of all the golf club came from the skakel house it did i mean there's really not much of a question about that somebody claims well it could have just been lying around on the lawn okay it could have but what are the chances so we're talking about also a time frame so Martha leaves Tommy, kiss, 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 and she's walking home. And within like a minute, a minute and a half, somebody who just happens to be in the area and just happens to have that golf club then decides to go caveman on her. And it's, a, it's two dudes. Now, here's the thing. 
You know that part about where her body was dragged 80 feet? It's 80 feet from the where she dies, where she bleeds out. And then there's a zigzag path to the tree that she's found under. Somebody dragged her, and that is proven by uh, physical evidence. So this, again, is what I call true evidence, not a bunch of nonsense. She was dragged. She wasn't carried. Got two guys. I'm going to ask you a question. If you got two dudes... And you want to move a body. Would you tell one dude to drag the body? And the other one's like, a lot of work, isn't it, buddy? The other one's like, dude, could you help me out here? <laughs> She's having, could you just pick up her damn feet for me? I mean, this is this has never been brought up. I've looked in Mark Furman's book, not brought up there. I've looked on the television shows, not brought up there. Why does nobody point this out? That if you have two people... One person is not going to be dragging that girl's body. You're going to have two people just pick her up and chuck her under a tree. It's a lot easier. So somebody dragged her body because 80, uh, what is it, 80 feet? 80 feet. It's a long way to drag bodies. Dead bodies are heavy. They just, they don't, they're just not easy. Somebody had to drag her and two guys aren't going to do this. And so what Mrs. Moxley says is, well, she thinks that Michael did kill Martha. And then somebody with a cooler head, and she must be, I don't know, I guess she's referring to Tommy, came out and helped him move the body. Well, then why aren't two people carrying the body? <laughs> Again, we have the same problem. It's ridiculous. If somebody is dragging a body, it's because they do not have help. And this is why I talk about many times I do these shows. Why do I do these shows? Because there's sometimes basic logic, and people can go on big academic explanations of things. But when the reality comes down to it, there's some basic logic. So two people did not commit this crime. One person who had to drag her body and what a pain in the butt that was. But they had at some point decided she was, although it was dark, she could be, it would be better if she were not out in the, as much in the open. And they, and there's some people, another thing they say is, oh, the guy had to know the area really well. I, I, you know, like you couldn't see better pine trees of, you know, a distance away and say, hey, this crappy little tree she's under is not much of a tree. It's like it was elm tree. So it was like a thin tree. And it's like, well, there's a body. Maybe if I go see, I see some big trees over there. Maybe if I just drag her under there, it, it won't be so noticeable. Also, her body under that little tree was right near another house. The house could, the people in that house could see her. So it made sense to think it was worthwhile dragging the body back toward an area where not so many people see her. So there's two things to figure out by this. When they say somebody had to know those, know, know the area, no, they didn't. But I'll tell you something. If those two dudes had come down there and killed her or somebody off the, the highway came and killed her, some serial killer from no place came and killed her, they aren't going to drag her body anyplace. They'll just leave her there and run. I mean, if you can run away as quick as you can go, no sense wasting your time. So somebody moved her because they themselves could not move out of the area, which means it had to be somebody who lived there who knew if this is brought back to me before I can get rid of evidence, I'm screwed. I can't disappear. So no, it's not a stranger from the highway. And I'm definitely no, it's not these two dudes. I don't know what Tony Bryant was on when he decided to claim his friends did. That makes no sense to me. But there's no proof that they were even there. There's certainly no proof that they committed any crimes. And how did they get hold of a Skakel golf club? Oh, yeah, again, just amazing luck. They just happened upon Martha at the exact moment she was leaving Tommy and going back to her house, and they happened to find a golf club from the Skakel's house at the same time. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. So let's start off with what we can get rid of. We can get rid of the stranger stuff, only because there was no point to all the stuff they would have done you know, there. I mean, a stranger could have killed her. Uh, the crap that it had to be as somebody who knew her is not true. A serial killer could have attacked her and then got spooked and ran away. That's possible. But the fact he went to all the work hiding her under a tree is what keeps me from thinking this is somebody from outside the community. Serial killer could be, but not somebody from outside the community. So yes, it had to be one person inside the community. Who was it? Now, the next thing um, I'm just going to check is my little list here. So one person, how many people? One person. Next, who had access to the golf club? And there's only really three people. Oh, oh, just for the sake of it, I ought to mention 
because uh, this is a possibility. And you got, you got, if you were, if you were investigating this crime, you should look at this. And they did, and they did. So let's look at the Moxley family. See that dude over here? That's John Moxley. And there, there's Martha, and there's John. Um, he's her older brother, and he said she was the perfect girl. Now, how many cases do we know where one of the siblings kills the other sibling because the other sibling is getting all the attention, and they're the perfect one, and they're pissed off? Could John have killed his sister, Martha? It's possible. I mean, he did not have an alibi, so could he have done it? He could have. Um, it, it, his, his mother did have similar clubs, but supposedly they actually found that the the, the set of clubs in the Skakel household was missing the exact club that was used. So I'm going to say it's still the Skakel club. Is he going to come across the Skakel club? Probably not. Uh, and again, okay, so Martha's coming home, you know, you know, from, from seeing Tommy and he attacks her because what in the middle of, you know, there's not a real good motive that I know of, um, especially again, at that moment in time. So I'm going to say, was he worth investigating? Absolutely. And he was pissed that he was investigated because it was his sister who had just been murdered. But he should have been investigated and, and and they did and didn't come up with a whole lot. But now take a look at, like, let's take a look for a minute at, at good old Michael. Okay, so Michael Skako, um was not a suspect for 20 years. And let me tell you how this all came about. Oh, Lord. Well, let me back up. Let's go to... We're going to even have to go further than murder in Greenwich. Oops, sorry. This book, here's my book. Okay. Before that, we have Dominique Dunn. And I don't know how many of you know who Dominique Dunn is. Dominique Dunn is, is a man who his daughter was also called Dominique. Um, I think his name is Dominique and her name is Dominique. But, okay, she was murdered uh, in, in L.A., by her uh, ex-boyfriend, he strangled her on the street. It was a horrific crime. And, and Dominique Dunn um, was appalled because the boyfriend didn't get, he got, he got manslaughter on it. And then he was out like in two years. It was appalling. I totally, my heart was out to D Dominic Dunn on that. He was absolutely right. It was a travesty of a, of, of a case in court. He was really r railing against the court system, which, which I do all the time. So I'm in his corner on that. Absolutely. So, but he is also a great writer. Um, so he wrote a lot of books. And I have to say, he's a very good writer. Um, he's he's, an, he's an engaging. He's really engaging. And, and the thing is, he, he, he got involved with his kind of like high society stuff. And people love high society stuff. It's stuff that most of us never have contact with. But he did. And he wrote all these books, fiction books, usually about high society. Well, one day he came across, you know, he looked at the Moxley murder. And he was upset by it because it was, you know, he said, I have a heart for victims and I have a heart for justice. I, I respect him for that. So he wrote a book called Season in Pur Purgatory, which was a fiction story, but clearly it was about the the, Mo the Moxleys and the Skakels. The Skakels were painted as a power hungry uh, uh, family who could cover up anything. And that one of their, one of their children killed this girl, whoever her name was in the story. And I think he was running for president or something, something weird like that. But anyway, it was, he didn't point out whether it was Tommy or Michael he was putting this on. But in reality, I think he, at that time, he was thinking it was Tommy. Later on, there became a belief that it was, was, uh, oh, let me put a picture of these guys. Um, so here, in case you don't know, this is Tommy. This is Michael. This is Michael at the time of the murder. And over here is Ken Littleton. This was the tutor that was sitting at the house watching these boys and who was also a suspect for many years. And I will get into Ken Littleton in a bit. But Tommy was the original suspect. And why was Tommy the original suspect? It made sense. Um, he was kissing, kissing on uh, Martha. And then Martha supposedly went home and he went inside the house. And then Martha ends up dead. Last person to see her. Maybe he was pissed off that she wouldn't give him what he wanted. And he followed her and killed her possible. Uh, he had the opportunity, absolutely had the opportunity. Uh, and so, so Dominique Dunn wrote this book very, kind of based on sort of Tommy Skakel. And then still nobody was arrested. Um, in reality, Ken Littleton became the major suspect after Tommy. And you might ask why Littleton, and I'll get to that in a minute. But Tommy was the original. Michael never, never was Michael actually a suspect until until 
murder in Greenwich. And this is why I talk about how the media and television authors and people looking for money can cause so much trouble. Now, Mark Furman over here, done, done a few shows with Mark Furman in my lifetime. Not one of my favorite folks, okay? I'm not saying he hasn't done some good work in time. I was appalled by his behavior in the OJ case. But, you know, I'm not going to hold something against you know person forever on that. But sometimes, yeah, I, I don't have an issue with his, his profiling or his investigative thinking. However, supposedly Dominique Dunn got together with him and gave him the Sutton report. And I will read some of the Sutton report to you, uh, which had this profile of who killed Martha Moxley. And again, the Sutton, the Sutton report you basically had the Academy uh, group write a, write a profile and it basically was painted onto one of the Skakel boys. And then, then Mark Furman decides to write, well, this book. And, and why doesn't he think Ken Littleton, why doesn't he write a book about Ken Littleton, the tutor being the killer? You know why? <laughs> because Ken Littleton is a nobody and nobody will want to read it. But if you can say one of the Skakels did it, you know, cousins of the Kennedys, people will buy your book. And they did. And that became a huge book. And then it, this is what pushed the prosecution to move on into, into saying that um, Michael Skakel was guilty after all these years. It just it was absolutely amazing. So let's take a look at our suspects. And I want to point out from the Sutton report what they said and why Michael Michael Skakel became a suspect. Uh, first of all, the reason Tommy Skakel, I think they dumped him as a suspect, this guy here, his brother, is simply because, I don't know, they didn't have anything on him. And then they thought, well, we'll, we'll move, we'll move over to, well, we'll move over to Michael here. And maybe we can, we can nail it on him. But let, listen to, listen to this profile. This is, this is a profile written by the Academy group. It was written in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure I'm right. After we already know all the details of the crime. Listen to this. Um, overkill. There was overkill in the crime. Overkill is defined as using more violence than necessary to kill a person. In this case, there were 14 to 15 blows to the victim's head. I'm not sure that's true, but okay. Any one of several of the blows would have resulted in death. Again, this is strongly indicative of anger and rage directed in a very personal way toward a victim. Now, oftentimes when you're profiling and people say, like, say for the person is like their face was bashed in or something, a profiler will say, well, that's because the killer was emotionally connected to the victim and wanted to annihilate her face. Well, you know, serial killers do the same damn thing. Sorry to tell you this, but serial killers become enraged too, you know, and they become enraged because the bitch made me do it. That's the whole, that's a whole routine with them. It's like, well, if the bitch hadn't said this, I wouldn't have had to you know, punch her in the face. I wouldn't have had to do whatever, but the bitch made me do it. So personal rage and serial killer rage are not that much different, but they want you to believe it when they want you to believe it. Now look at this one. Body disposal site. The area selected to dispose of the body is not one that will be selected by a person unfamiliar with the area. Again, it's not, it's not that big a deal to drag a body from a more open space to a less open space. You know, that you would need to do it is the real issue, but not that you had to know the area. And one of the reasons they're saying this is because they're trying to say that Ken Littleton, the tutor who was also home at that time and had access to the golf club, and has, I'll talk all about the sketchy stuff with him in a bit. He was there. He was a suspect for many years, but they're trying to take away you believing that he could be the guy. So they're saying that since he moved in only the night before, he wouldn't know anything about the area. Nonsense. Okay. So let's look at the next thing they said. Oh, the subject who committed this crime resided within easy walking distance of the victim's residence. Okay and was from the same socioeconomic status as the victim. I'm sorry, how the hell would you know that? A woman gets beaten to death walking home. You have no clue whether the person is the same socioeconomic status. Oh, and weren't the Skakos like massively richer than the Moxleys? But you know, no, they were like, they had to be supposedly the same status, which would take out Littleton because he was just a, te a tutor and worked at the school. So it couldn't be him. Okay, next thing. Uh, in all likelihood, he grew up in a family setting considered by others to be wealthy or high class. Again, from the crime scene, there's no way you can get that crap. 
due to his young age, which I said was amazingly enough, the age of these two guys and not the age of him. Uh, we believe he was unemployed. <laughs> I can't believe people write profiles like this in their ex-FBI profiles. It's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> we believe he was unemployed. Oh, because these two boys were schoolboys, and that guy was employed as a tutor. So it couldn't be the employed guy. It had to be the unemployed guy. How do you know from a crime scene if the dude is unemployed? And this is nonsense. I do a thing called deductive profiling, which means you look at the evidence and you come up with your determinations from there. You don't make shit up. Okay, then, <laughs> let, look at this, let's see. <laughs> the offender, <laughs> I'm sorry, this whole thing is so bad, it makes me laugh. The offender was a social friend of the victim. Again, like you would know that. And had regular <laughs> interaction with her, which means can't be Littleton, possibly on a daily basis. Must be these two guys. The familiarity of the victim, coupled with her, her good looks and flirtatious personality, helped foster a strong, amorous feelings to her. <laughs> really? <laughs> so you, you, oh my God, because she's a flirt, she gets killed. Because somebody could have amorous feelings, she gets killed. Not because you're maybe a psychopath who saw a hot babe and has issues. And I will get to all those issues about Littleton in a minute. Oh my God, this is so dumb. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> the fact that the offender in this case chose to confront the victim outside and on her driveway provides several useful clues in understanding his approach method and mindset. It is apparent that he, one, knew the victim. Well, no, it doesn't mean a damn thing. Anybody could have been lurking around there and killed her. Um, again, dragging the body is a different matter, but anybody could have just killed her. Knowing she was coming home at that, around that time frame. Well, there are people that know she was going home at that time frame. Tommy, because he, she supposedly kissed and said, I got to go home. And Littleton, who's totally aware that she was, because he was lurking about, so she was going home. All right. Michael, he wasn't even there. And I will get to that in a minute, too. Wasn't even there. He wasn't even there at all. And I will, there's such an amazing thing about this. So hang, if you don't leave, I have got the most amazing point on that about the time frame of her death and, and how they tried to basically railroad this guy. Um, <laughs> okay. She and Tommy were cavorting publicly by the side of the house. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what happened. Okay. Uh, there is another point here and I can't, I can't locate it right here. Apparently they also said that, <laughs> and this is a really funny one, that the guy would be a peeping Tom. <laughs> Again, from the from the murder that you saw, somebody gets beaten to death with a golf club. How do you know the guy's a peeping Tom? Oh, because Michael Skakel later said, I went up in a tree and jacked off, which is what, what got him completely ruined in this thing. He was a 15-year-old kid who did like Martha, and supposedly he came home at 11.30 at night. He had been drinking, had been smoking weed. And he supposedly went looking, you know, lurking around because it was it was like the day before Halloween and he was running around and he supposedly climbed from a tree and threw some pebbles at, you know, some window, which wasn't supposedly actually Martha's, but he thought it was. And he supposedly tried to jack off in a tree and it didn't work well. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. It, it's it, People say, well, that's totally creepy and makes him a killer. No, it's totally 15 years old. And why he, would, why he would admit it is another issue. Some people said, well, it's because he found out later on that there might be DNA at the air, in the area. But, you know, DNA was never found on Mar Martha Moxie. She was never supposed to even raped. So I don't think that was his reasoning. I'm more like he was, you know, Michael Skakel has a big mouth. He's one of those people that is almost sometimes blur blurtingly, truthful about things and just says what his comes right to his mind. Um, but even if you want to think of him as creepy for being a 15 year old jacking off in a tree, um, still, <laughs> where, where does the profile come off with? Oh, it has to be a peeping Tom. You know why? Because they were painting this thing on Michael Skakel, painting it on him. And that's one of the problems I've seen with certain profiles that are done way later. And when there is a reason to do them for purposes of whatever, so simply painting, painting it on there. And it just, it, and it appalls me. So now let's look, let's go. Now we're going to go on to Michael Skaka, why it's probably not him and why it's most more likely to be this guy or even more likely to be him. Three major suspects, three. And I, they're all here. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I would say at this point, you know, that's why the, um, the original 
investigative team never arrested anybody because I couldn't quite figure out who it was. First, they thought of Tommy, never thought of Michael, um, never thought of Michael. And Littleton was a suspect for years and for damn good reason. And I will get into that right now. But first of all, take a look at this point. Um, time of the crime. Could he have done it? Could Michael Skakel have done it? And this is the most fascinating part ever. Okay, let's see if I can find the right spot here. Okay, hopefully. He did have a solid alibi till 1130 at night. <laughs> How did he commit the crime? There was, when they when they looked at Martha, uh, did the autopsy, supposedly the contents of her stomach proved that she probably died between 930 and 10. Uh, that was also the last time she was seen by Tommy. So somebody killed her right after she left Tommy, either by Tommy or by somebody else. Um, Michael wasn't there. He was at away. He was not there till 1130. That's when he came back. Now, <laughs> this is also fascinating. So two things happened. First, the prosecution moved the time frame because he had witnesses and people who passed polygraphs that said he was not on the property between 930 and 10. They actually moved the time frame till after 1130 at night because they wanted him to be able to be back on the property. So, <laughs> so now they said, okay, well, even in the autopsy, maybe the food, I don't know, maybe it took a little longer to disappear. I mean, they really didn't have anything, but they tried to make it sound like, yes, she could have died after 1130. So Michael came home. So this is a new theory then, and which worked in court. Just, uh, they, they presented a bunch of silly theories. Anyway, he comes home at 1130. And at that time, well, here's the thing. Uh, and this is one of the most important points on this case. And again, nobody brings it up. Just like two people didn't move the body because how stupid was that? If two people would have picked the body up and moved her, clearly one person dragged the body. Nobody brings that up. Here's a second thing nobody brings up. Okay, let's assume that she was killed at 1130, 12 o'clock at night. Where the hell was she from 930 to 1130 at night? Somebody tell me where the girl was. So she's kissing on Tommy and then she leaves. Her house is only a minute away. What is she doing? Is she sleeping under a tree? Is she running around in circles, praising the moon? Well, nobody saw her. Not one of her friends saw her. Nobody picked her up and saw her and brought her back. Her brother didn't see her. Littleton didn't see her. That creepy dude. Uh, Tommy ne saw, never saw her again, supposedly. Where the hell was she for two hours until Michael... Then, now it's even funnier. So somehow for two hours, Martha is like dancing around in the trees. And by luck, Michael comes home at 1230 uh, to 1130 at night and runs into Martha just hanging out under the trees near her house, apparently by now. So now he goes, oh, dang, here's Martha. Let me kill her. What? Seriously, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> This is how stupid this stuff is. I mean, I can't believe it. It's like we're all the people in the world out here investigating profiling. Do, is there not somebody who's going to say something? Well, I, I just said it, but where are the, Where is everybody saying this? It's stupid. It's plain stupid. Okay, so you know it was so stupid that during the trial they came up with a family friend. And let me see if I can read what she said. This cracked me up because that was so stupid that apparently that's not so good. So then the family friend says. Oh, where is it? It's so funny. Um, where is it? Okay. Oh, okay. So now the family friend from the neighborhood, now we're talking about two maybe decades later, claims Michael never went on the ride because, you know, clearly it makes no sense that he came home 1130 at night and found a, found Martha just running around in the trees for two hours. It makes so little sense. Oh yeah. Okay. We better move it back to 930. So we can't then, we have to get we have to get this schmuck back to, to the house at 930. How do we do that when five people, I think it was five, said he was in someplace else for two hours? Okay, so now the family friend claims Michael never went on the ride. He never, he got out of the car with Tommy and, and Martha. <laughs> in 1991, she said she didn't see them leave. So she actually, in 1991, she claimed she never saw the car leave. And so she didn't know who was actually in the car. In 2012, she said her memory improved. <laughs>
really is this <laughs> why do we have a jury system if they bought this nonsense it's just unbelievable so all these years later one woman one woman claims that he didn't actually leave the property now mind you littleton never saw michael on the property at that time tommy never saw michael on the property at that time but amazingly enough this one girl saw him get out of the car years later and everybody else lied about it <laughs> okay nonsense okay dude wasn't on the property never was on the property from 9 30 to 10 when this went down and there, okay so let's go into other reasons why it ain't this dude all right so oh lord okie dokie so now let me look at my little list here okay now let's talk about ability to commit this crime all right this is Michael Skakel at the time, 15 years old. As people said, they described him as looking like a little girl. He was, a, he was not a big dude, a little girl. You're going to tell me that this 15-year-old is going to beat the living hell with the strength that he had and drag her body 80 feet. I don't think so. I'm going to go with the older boy or the big, what they called him, hulking guy. Hulking, huge, big football playing rugby playing dude all right he's 23 years old he has the much more of the ability than any little 15 year old kid 15 year old kid are you are you kidding me and also on top of it um she was punched and broke her nose was broken and and she was beat beat and beat first and then beat with a golf club i'm sorry but i'm gonna go with big hulking dude and not Little boy, 15 years old, who's in a bad mood. Oh, oh, so some of you will say, but didn't he beat chipmunks to death with golf clubs? You know where that story came from? That guy. Little Tim was the one who claimed he saw him beating chipmunks to death. Little, Tim, Little Tim is a absolute pathological liar. So anything he says about what happened is questionable. So I just cannot see how this 15-year-old little boy is going to kill Martha. Also, Supposedly, here's here's where you get this nonsensical crap out of uh, uh, profiling. That was somebody who's really emotionally involved. He was jealous over his brother, and he saw his brother kiss Martha, so he went and killed her. Really? I mean, first of all, both of the boys are rich boys. Both of them are rich boys. Are you telling me that at some point in life, he's only 15, and he can't get another girl, you know, that, that he has to kill her? Even Tommy, too. Let's say Tommy was on the lawn with her and he got so far with her and then she said no more and she pulled up her pants and she went running off does he really need to kill her or can he just think i'll get her next time next time i'll confess her to have sex with me neither neither one of these this is good neither one of these boys is a great suspect for that kind of a massive violent crime just because they didn't get laid by martha moxley i mean really that's that that's really it's hard to believe this guy massive problems with women massive problems with them. But before I get there, I'm going to read you this because this, this, I want to point this out before I go on about how editing it should be considered unethical and should do you in the minute you do it. Listen to this. Benedict played a critical passage from Michael's own book proposal to sum up his case. But the passage he used was edited in such a way that what the jury heard appeared to be a confession to murder. And I woke up to Mrs. Moxley saying, Michael, has, have you seen Martha? I was like, oh my God, did they see me last night? And I remember just having a feeling of panic. Like, oh, shit. But here is what Benedict intentionally left out. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I hope God nobody saw me jerking off. Then I woke up to Mrs. Moxley saying, Michael, has, have you seen Martha? I was like, oh my God. Did they see me last night? In hearing this myself, yeah. without the, the preamble about masturbating, is that Mrs. Moxley wakes him up and he says, Oh my God, did they see me last night? And over in the corner is a picture of the battered body of Martha. Oh my God, did they see me last night? I had a feeling of panic. And they're looking at the picture of her and the suggestion... Yeah. to anybody is that he's actually talking about murdering her and and isn't that 
really taking him out of context. No, I don't think so. I if think I did this fair, on 48 hours, I'd yeah, be fired. I think it's a fair suggestion based upon uh, the uh, evidence of the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's unethical. It's unethical, and you presented, you presented a lie to the jury, and the jury fell for it because they didn't have time to analyze every piece of information, and they only got what you presented to them. So yeah, unethical as hell. Uh, not that 48 hours hasn't done the same thing, so mm -mm, well, there's okay. Um, and I know they have, but I'm just going to say there's a lot of editing going on everywhere depending on whatever story you want to present. And when I did the Oxygen Channel documentary, one of the reasons I got so pissed was that although they presented what I said, they edited out all the other stuff that supported my arguments and was very, very important to making my argument. And then they, they dissed it. So I'll show you the dissing later, but let's, let's go to um, Littleton. So this Benedict played a hit the button. Okay. This guy, Littleton. Okay. He was a tutor a big hulking dude who the, the Skakels hired because I personally think, you know, poor, poor Rush Skakel didn't, you know, his wife had died. He didn't make the best choices. I mean, he hired the Sutton people who I thought was, I said was the most abysmal investigation reporting I've ever seen that got his own kids in trouble and they were just disastrous. Um, but nobody talks about the horrible Sutton report. Um, but I don't, you know, he was, he just, he's just trying to get by that dude. So he hired this guy, to hang out with the boys, you know, a bigger guy, a teacher from their school, a tutor from their school. He'll, you know, that, that, that might help my boys, you know, have somebody in the house when I'm not there. So this guy comes and moves in. Now he'd been around the property before, but he moved in the night before. Um, and so here is Michael. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot his name now. <laughs> Littleton. Ken Littleton. Michael and Ken are getting confused in my mind. Ken Littleton. So Ken Littleton. Let me talk about Ken. Okay. So an interesting thing happened with these two guys. Michael was not there. Again, Michael was not there. Tommy was and Littleton was. They're each other's alibis. Some people think they acted together. I don't think this is true, again, because if the two of them acted together, first of all, I don't know why Littleton would help some, some killer you know, killed off some kid, woman in the neighborhood. I don't know why he'd get involved. You know, what, what, what would be the point? Um, so, and again, two people didn't drag the body. One person did. So I don't believe in the two people theory at all. But these two guys were both there in and out of the house. Um, and what happened was they ended up being each other's alibis. I believe the alibi was we watched part of the French connection together and the chase scene. Now, I think this is what happened. Tommy knew that he was in trouble because probably he kissed Mar Martha. Let's assume he didn't kill her. Let's see, kissed Martha, goes back, hangs out, does whatever he's doing. Not probably writing the, the report on Abraham Lincoln he claimed and that he said, no, he didn't do that. Okay, so he probably had a lot of time, which he was just by himself. Meanwhile, this dude's also got a lot of unaccounted for time by himself. You know, when the police are looking at you, maybe the two of them just simply got together and said, hey, dude. You know, I was there, but, you know, I, I can't prove where I was all the time. He goes, yeah, me too. I got the same problem. Well, you know, French Connection was on. Why don't we just say we were there when the chase scene went on? Because that, that's about the right time. Okay, you you back me, I'll back you. Neither one of necessarily thinking, supposedly, that the other one committed the crime. Now, so I, I, I think the fact that they're each other's alibis is interesting. And, and Littleton really had it out for Michael. He kept saying all kinds of nasty things about Michael, but would not say anything negative about Tommy. And well, he actually did, but about the, about the alibi, no. So I think he was trying to protect himself with that alibi. Now, here's another interesting thing that happened about Littleton. After this happened, Littleton went with the two boys up to some cabin. Rush sent them to after this all went down. He went with these two boys. Now, now let's, let's look at this. There are three suspects, okay? These two boys, well, Michael wasn't there, but if he thinks his own brother Tommy did something bad, he's probably gonna like think, oh, well, you know, it's still my brother, right? And Tommy did it, he didn't worry about it because he did it. Littleton, on the other hand, has got to think to himself, son of a bitch, I'm going up to a lone cabin with a psychopathic crazed murderer. Now, I, yeah, he was making some money, but is that worth it? Is that worth going to a cabin with maybe a lunatic, somebody who is so out of control that he may murder you in your sleep? Is that really worth it? Or did he go because he wasn't worried about either one of those dudes because he knows exactly who killed Martha Moxley? I say that's much more logical. 
So that's an interesting aside. Okay, let's continue. What kind of person is Moth Littleton? Okay, where, where do I just go here? Take a look at Littleton. Uh, Littleton has a litany of crimes after that. Um, he was in Nantucket. Apparently he was stealing stuff, burying people, stuff he stole. And the one story is, and you know, I'm having trouble verifying it entirely, but I've seen it in places where it seems to be relatively legit. He was arrested for breaking and entering um, and supposedly was found naked on top of a, he climbed through a window in Nantucket and laid on top of a woman naked, kissing on him. If that's true, and also there were other supposed attempted rapes. Now, if those, those things are actually true, then he is a possible serial rapist. Um, I'd say that's more concerning than what I've seen from these two guys who, from what I know, have led normal lives ever since. Um, we have no history of, uh, I mean, they were messed up. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say they were messed up. You know why they were messed up? They were rich boys. Their mother died when they're teen years, they were messed up. They admit they were messed up. They got into, uh, you know, uh, substance abuse and stuff like that. Um, not saying they were perfect at all, but what's really funny is these guys were not perfect. They had issues, but for some reason, the media and even the host of Oxygen what wants to let this guy off the hook. Now, wait a minute. One more thing before I go to how she let him off the hook. Listen to this. Do you think that Ken Littleton killed Martha Moxley? Okay. I, I hit the wrong button first. Lie detector test. When, when Tommy took his first lie detector test, he, he was inconclusive and then he passed. Michael has never failed a lie detector test. He's always passed. Littleton failed five polygraph tests. Five. That's hell of a lot because the guy changes his story constantly. Um, he, 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 he's, he's but, but you know what people try to say is, oh, well, he's psychotic. Therefore he's, he's bipolar. He can't handle himself. No, that's not true. Maybe it's because he is what he is and people don't want to admit it, but it's funny because he's got massive issues, but, and so these guys have some issues too, but so now I'm going to get to Let's see, where is it? Uh, okay, here's my here's the question that was asked to me at the end of this show. Do you think that Ken Littleton killed Martha Moxley? I would say the evidence that exists as of today would put, in my opinion, Ken Littleton still at the top of the suspect list. Okay, now notice how carefully I framed that, as did the, the police at the time. Uh, I do not disapprove of the police investigation, as did... Mark Furman, who wanted to paint this crime on on uh, on Mike, Michael Skakel with a very, very poor profile, in my opinion, uh, because I, I don't care about money. I don't care who has power and who doesn't. I care about evidence. And like the police, there are three suspects. I can't do this. Why? why one over here. No, that, that doesn't work. Ooh, two over here. <laughs> one over here. It's, it's hard with a green screen. Let me tell you, I'm trying. I'm still trying to learn how to figure that two over here and one over here. Three suspects that cannot be excluded from the investigation. The, Michael, why he was never a suspect for so long is because he wasn't there. Tommy, because yeah, he was the last person that saw Martha, maybe could have run after her and, and got pissed off and killed her. Little Tim, because damn, that guy, that guy had opportunity. He was big enough to commit the, big and strong enough to commit the crime and drag her and had, could have gotten rid of the stuff. Maybe he went up to, you know, when he took the boys up to the cabin, he had, he took his own car, which would give him opportunity to get rid of evidence. Uh, nobody was looking at him in the very, very beginning. He was an excellent suspect. Do I think Ken Littleton killed Martha Moxley? I'll never say that. I will say he is still my top suspect. Michael Skakel, I see no evidence pointing to him whatsoever. Tommy, but Ken Skakel still comes in as a top suspect. Um, after I presented all this evidence, let's look, let's look at the evidence I presented on, Mike, on, on Littleton. One, that he had opportunity. Two, he might have had motive. He's a, he's, if he's a serial rapist type and he's got issues with women, believe me, he had so many problems with women, um, violent violent stuff with women, threatening to kill them and uh, going through windows and attempting to rape them, if that is accurate in that report. I mean, we're talking about a guy. They actually looked at him as a, a possible serial killer because a lot of women seemed to die where he was around. Don't have proof of that, so I'm not going to go there. But he was definitely... He's been in psychiatric institutes. This dude has major problems. And he was, nobody got killed in Bell Heaven until that dude showed up. Okay. So could he have done it? Absolutely. Could Michael Skakel have done it? No. Could Tommy have done it? 
possibly, but then you have to look at what the heck he's, he's like a better suspect. So all in all, I presented all this information and seriously, seriously, after I presented my, mind you, I was edited a lot. I, that what was left out was that if, if the, if the time was moved to 1130, where the hell was Ma Martha Moxley? Was she just running around in the trees for two hours? What was left out was the issues. All the other things I just talked about, all those were edited. So even though a good portion of this, this, uh, this um, documentary wasn't too bad. Why did the host then decide to say just out of, oh, you know, he just seems like he's not a killer. He just seems like a guy who needs help. Seriously. Why doesn't Michael Skakel seem like just a guy who needs help? Why is Tommy Skakel not a guy who just needs help? Why is he just a guy who needs some help? But even though he might be a serial rapist, even though he exhibits anger toward women, even though he had the opportunity, even though he's bigger than the other boys and was there when this happened, why, why are you excluding him? She never tells you why he is being excluded. You know why? Because there was an agenda. When this program was done. And this is why I stopped doing documentaries. The agenda was we're still going to paint it on Michael Skakel. We don't care about the truth of the evidence. We're going to present it as if we care. And then we're going to leave out enough of it and say it wasn't uh, and then go on. And that's exactly what they did. And at the end of this documentary, it's still Michael Skakel. And that pissed me off because I was brought in as a, as an expert. And then after I was dismissed Okay, all your ideas. I'm not even going to argue the ideas. I'm not even going to say you're wrong. I'm just going to exclude enough of it. Well, I'm just going to say not so. Now, my issue isn't with an ego. It's not like, how can you disagree with Pat Brown? <laughs> A lot of people disagree with Pat Brown. That's not the point. The point is, the point is, do we pay attention to evidence? Do we want to present the correct thing to the public and to juries? Or are we just into presenting what makes us a shitload of money. And if, if I, when I, when, when, when Mike, Michael Skakel was just a, a arrested and was going to trial, I spoke out and said it was Michael, uh, that it was more likely, not that it was more like a Ken Littleton. And I take, I took a hell of a hit over saying that, except from, uh, I think it was a, the, uh, one of the, 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 probably Robert, I can't remember who contacted me, but somebody who said, thank you very much. Now, interestingly, Robert Kennedy, by the way, excellent book, this one framed Robert Kennedy goes through all the reasons why it could be, uh, the different people. And he points out a lot of information about, uh, Ken, uh, uh, Ken Littleton. And also he does a great article called it's on, it's on, um, it's on, what the hell is it? Um, oh, it's on Atlantic. If you, if you, you know, if you haven't gotten too many free views of Atlantic, the Atlantic does a wonderful article called the Miscar a miscarriage of justice by Robert F. Kennedy. He points at all many, many issues about Littleton. Um, and then interestingly enough, by the time he wrote this book, you know, those that remember, remember this guy who said two dudes came in and maybe, maybe killed him. And you see Kennedy saying, maybe it was these guys. And you wonder what the hell is he talking about? Why would he go there now? Why wouldn't he be back with, um, you know, why wouldn't he, why is he, is he moving away from Littleton? And I'll tell you what happened there because I know how things work. Um, he was trying to save his brother from prison is what he was trying to do. He was trying to get his brother out of prison. He was wanting to throw anything at the wall in order to get him out of prison. I don't think he believes these two guys had anything to do with it. I believe he stands firmly with Littleton, but he can't quite say that. So consequently, he's got to, he's got to go back and say, Hey, you know, it could be these other two guys. <laughs> So he presents all of this in framed very good book in that uh, he explains things very well. Um, and, uh, but this book that's called a money maker. I believe Mark Furman picked, decided to paint this on Michael Skakel in order to sell a shitload of books. I'm sorry. I'm not a fan of Mark, uh, Mark Furman. I'm not. And I, there's, I mean, I could go through this book. I have all these little, little, little uh, things in the book where I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding. BS, BS. For example, why I don't think Ken Littleton committed the crime. Littleton had no connection with Martha. From the crime scene and body, we know the victim knew the suspect. Oh, bullshit. That's bullshit. Okay. Um, Ken was in the master bedroom unpacking. Then he spent the rest of the evening watching the French connection. That's not an alibi, dude. That's not an alibi. Oh, Littleton is always stuck to the same story. It's not an alibi. An alibi is when somebody can prove you were there. And of course they say there's a little few minutes where uh, Tommy says he, they hung together. But an alibi is where you can absolutely like, you know, I was delivering a, 
a speech. I was a reverend at a church and I delivered a speech in the pulpit for two hours and that's when my wife was killed. Good alibi. Um, <laughs> let's see. I, I put BS, literally. I can't, I don't know if you can see it. I put BS by so many things in this freaking book uh, because I was so pissed off. Littleton had no opportunity. He wasn't familiar with the house or the neighborhood. What? He, 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 he could have been standing outside. No, by the way, Littleton was a skulker. Littleton was a skulker. He was skulking around the property. He even said he went out because there were dogs and he didn't like them. He went out with the, with golf clubs to check on the dogs. He's out there. He could have easily seen Martha. What kind of nonsense is this bullshit? Littleton had no motive. What, if he's a serial rapist, he's got no motive? If, that's, if he's got an issue with women, he's got no motive? What kind of crap? Oh, he's a big, good-looking guy. He's a he's a big, good-looking, big, good-looking guy who had trouble with every woman he was ever with and attacked women. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Oh Lord. Oh, he had no propensity toward extreme physical violence, except he attacked people. Okay. Uh, look, look at this one. Littleton had no money, no powerful family behind me. If Littleton had murdered Martha Moxie, who would not have gotten away with it? Do you know how many serial killers are out there have gotten away with it because? That nobody knows it's Sam or they don't have enough evidence to prove it. That has nothing to do with a damn thing. Oh my God. Sorry. Sorry. The whole book pisses me off. And now I will take your questions because <sighs> I take a deep breath. I will take your questions. I get back to the comments, which are 52 now. <laughs> oh my God. Oh Lord God. Okay. So I'm going to see what I've missed. Oh, uh, Erna says, thank you for the information. Some of this I've never heard before. Very interesting. You know, you know why I've never heard it before? Because the media doesn't want you to hear it. And, and I have been in the media for over 15 years and I quit. I quit doing stuff with the media and now I'm on YouTube. And guess what? Nobody can shut me up. And when I was in, in the media, I got edited, 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 or 90 seconds, or they didn't invite me on. Sometimes they would call me and say, we're doing our pre-interview. Pre-interviews are very popular. You know why? Because they say, what do you think? Who do you think killed Martha Moxley? And I'll go, well, you know, I don't think, I think that there's too much proving that Michael Skakel had an alibi and, and he's only a little teeny 15 year old kid. I can't see it's him. I think it's Ken Littleton. Oh, thank you very much. We'll call you another time. <laughs> That's the way it works. That is the way it works. Absolute way it works. That's sad, but true. Okay. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> okay. Julia says, everything I've watched on pinning the murder on Michael Skakel was patches at best, but I've always wondered why they want it to be Michael so bad. Mark Furman is junk. Okay. Why do they want it to be him? Money, money and fame, money and fame. Um, you know, when we look at Dominic Dunn, he was super into fame. You know, people don't understand this, that you, you know, people are the same person before their loved one is murdered as they are after their loved one is murdered. So you don't become a different person. Um, so, you know, he may have Dominic Dunn. I'm not saying he's dead now. So, uh, but you know, he's done, he cared about his daughter tremendously and her crime, the murder, her murder was horrific. And he's right about the court system. I'm on his side with the court system, but he was also caught up in his own world of, you know, writing books about famous people. And he spent a lot of time hobnobbing with famous people. And he wrote this book and he then he backed Mark Furman because for whatever reasons, you know, I think one of the problems is Michael Skakel just wasn't well liked by people outside of his circle. A lot of people who know Michael Skakel say he's a great guy. I have no freaking clue if he's a good guy or a bad guy or is an asshole. I don't know. I don't go drinking with him. You know, I don't know anything about Michael Skakel. I pay attention to evidence, but you know, he, I don't know what he's like, but he is a target because he is a person that makes people money, you know, because say, if you went after Littleton, you ain't getting shit. I mean, nobody gives a crap about Littleton. You write a book about Littleton. I'm guarantee you it's not, not very imp impressive. As a matter of fact, after I do finish my, uh, my, <laughs> my video here, I will not get huge kudos and I will get a lot of people attacking me and I will not get this uh, shared with a ton of people because people want it to be Michael Skakel. They want the, the rich guy to go down, the rich guy, the power to go down. They want this poor put upon fella under misunderstood to 
be okay. He's just a tragic figure. They keep using the word tragic figure. Tragic figure. That dude lied and he's a, he's a psycho. He exhibits psychopathic traits and he attacks people and he's and he's a criminal. <laughs> what, what, what are you talking about? But people love to take down people of power and control. I don't care about any of that stuff. I mean, I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're the richest guy in the world or the poorest guy in the world. If you kill people, I have an issue. So um, let's see. Uh, I've had to be someone with access to the golf club. Yes. I mean, there, that's what I say. Is there's only three people. Let's face it. Three people. And that's the way it is. Um, the jury had heard edited remarks from Michael. Why didn't his defense lawyer object or get the full info presented? Well, why do you think that the Skakels went after the defense attorney and say he presented, he did, did a poor job of defense. He, he failed. And that's, that's how, that's how, that's their appeal process. And, and you know, I don't know, Mickey Sherman, I'm not going to say he's a bad lawyer, or a good lawyer. It's just that this is a, Mickey Sherman pointed out an interesting thing. He said, once you, once you lose in court, you go after the lawyer because it's your last chance. But yeah, I don't know that Mickey Sherman was a great lawyer or a poor lawyer, but should he have gone after some of the things I think he should have gone after? Yes, I do think so. And Maybe it was a shitty lawyer <laughs> in that particular case. And there was a good reason. Um, I never understood what these people are trying to flip things upside down and protect criminals. Very common on YouTube, true crime channels. You know, that is very true. And this is why I speak up against it so much. Um, I think people like the underdog, whoever they consider the underdog to be, whether they consider it Stephen Avery of making a murderer or they consider it. Ken Littleton, poor little tutor dude, when he was up against the guys with massive money, they don't seem to care about evidence as much as they care about emotion. And that's what I'm fighting against because this kind of thing that we see on YouTube with people following YouTube channels and being angry about people who supposedly were railroaded who weren't and not caring about people who were railroaded <laughs> because they're rich. Um, the emotion, the lack of ability to be calm and look at the evidence and say, hey, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Has led us to a point where, where the, the prosecutions are receiving tremendous pressure from the public to go after people they shouldn't go after. And also, these are the people that show up on juries, which is why I'm opposed to the jury system, because you got 12 people just like YouTube who will say, just not understand the evidence. They shouldn't be on, there should be no public, uh, you know, the jury system we have is, is nonsensical. Just, uh, just, just, just appalling. Oh, thank you. 100%. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, and thank you again. <laughs> I'm a gift. I don't know how much of a gift I am. I could, I could be a joke person. But, um, but <laughs> <laughs> she says, love when Pat gets fired up. <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, <sighs> you know, there's a lot of stuff I've done over the years, and I've seen a lot, um, experienced a lot. I know a lot. Um, and I have sympathies in many quarters, but there's also things that I, concern me over where does justice really lie? Where are we being fair? We can't, A, we can't solve every crime and not a police, de the police department in this case did work their butts off. I, 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 I take, I disagree with Dunn and Furman who want to trash the police department. They had, they had a problem. They didn't have the handle of the golf club. If they had had that, they might have fingerprints, they might have had whatever they might have had. What they had was a dead girl, no DNA evidence, and three suspects, and they could never pin it down. They they believed it was Littleton. For most of the time, they believed it was Littleton. But you can't take a guy to court unless you can prove he committed the crime. I agree with the police. I don't know that I would have taken Littleton to court either. I, I certainly wouldn't have taken Michael to court because that's ridiculous. But if they, you know. He spent 11 years in prison. You know, it's an interesting thing. Martha, Martha Moxley's mother, Dorothy Moxley, says, she she stridently says she believes it's, 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 um, uh, it is a Moxley. And on top of that, it's Michael. Uh, I'm sorry, Michael Skakel. It's a Skakel and it's Michael Skakel. And I'm thinking, you know, and she says adamantly, it's not Littleton. And they, once upon a time, they used to think it could be Littleton. You know, and I think at this point, if you you if a guy's been in jail, prison for 11 years, Michael Skakel was in there for 11 years. 
if you find out that it wasn't Michael Skakel and you help push this, you're going to feel such horrible guilt over putting an innocent man in prison for that period of time. I think she 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 can't go there, um, and I, I I see where she's coming from. It's just it's just it's a horrifying thing. Um, <laughs> what's her? Oh, I didn't know a lot of this either, but glad I caught this one for sure. Yeah, you know, a lot of this isn't presented, um, and especially let's say the basic the basic logic. And again, I'll go over it. Um, Michael Skakel had an alibi. And if he came home at 1130, he couldn't have, the, the fact that he would have killed Martha Moxley after she was running around in the trees for two hours is ridiculous. Uh, one person claimed he didn't get in the car in order to bring him back at 930. And yet he was this wimpy little dude. I mean, I'm sorry. It's, it's just nothing that put, oh, and also I didn't tell to bring this up for, for that matter. Um, uh, getting rid of evidence. He's 15 years old. He's drunk. He's smoking weed. You think he's really good at getting rid of all the evidence, any blood evidence, any and 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 the, and the piece of really okay. So so maybe Mrs. Moxley is correct that somebody helped him get rid of the evidence, which would have to be Tom. I'm sorry, Tommy. It couldn't it wouldn't have been Littleton. Littleton can give a shit that little because he never liked Michael, so he probably that little shit go down. Yep. Yeah. But so did Tommy help his little brother get rid of evidence? It could have, but I mean, really, I mean, this this is a kid. A kid, and I'm, I'm, I, it's not that I believe that 15 year olds can't be violent because God knows we've seen some things in the news recently where 15 year olds would commit um, carjackings and shoot people. They do. This wasn't, this wasn't a kid who ran with gangs and ran with guns. I mean, this was a kid who played, you know, it, it, it played well, theoretically golf, so which is why they want to pin it on him. But this is a kid who, you know, went fishing with his family and was rich as shit. And it's true. I mean, really, is he really going to commit that kind of a crime? I mean, does he really, have, even if he's messed up, is it really something a, f a small 15 year old kid is going to commit? I just, I, I don't know. I just think it's nonsensical. Um, what do you think motivated that agenda? Was it malicious or trying to help him or just sensationalism? Money, money. I swear to God over and over money. Um, what makes money? Journalism has, as is no longer about ethics and truth and and being being the um, the people that provide uh, uh, information to the public to the citizens of the United States. It media has gone now very bad trail of just per, per doing anything that makes money, um, and, and it's sad because I mean I used to be involved in the media a lot, but as it went downhill, I'm like you know can't do it anymore. Just can't do it anymore. Um, not all of it is bad. I mean, not everybody is bad in the media. People say, oh, do you hate everybody? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I've worked with some really nice people. And I know that a lot of people are stuck in the middle. They, you know, they got their job. They're finally a host of a show. And do you not think that the people behind the host are telling them what they have to say and do? They do. And you know, now you've, you've worked 20 years. You finally got this great job. And then, and then your, your puppeteers will say, you better do this or, you know, you can't be on. We're going to, you're going to lose your job. You got to do what you got to do. Um, so it, it, it puts people in a bad position. Same thing for the police. I mean, if you've worked all your life, you spent 20 years on the street, you finally get in the homicide department and you work on a case and maybe you see that maybe something went a little awry on the case and somebody comes in and says, what about this? And you go, you know, and then the police chief's like, you know, <laughs> We're, we're going to be, we're gonna, it's political suicide. We go public with this now. The journalists are going to kill us. And on top of that, you're going to lose your damn job. You got family to feed, don't you? So everybody's got certain issues, you know, that they have to deal with. And it's only when you don't care anymore. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah, I don't really. Uh, you know, I'm 66 years old. I'll survive. I'm not going for a job. I'm not going for a I know, a position of host of my own show. Um, you know, I have freedom. Uh, and that gives me an amazing amount of ability to not give a shit about what anybody else thinks or what they're going to tell me to do because nobody tells me what to do. But it's just, an, it's, I'm in a place in my life where I can do that. And, you know, I don't know. I Just to be fair, if I were 30 years old, and maybe I was going to get my own damn show and I was going to have the Pat Brown profiling show or whatever. I've been up for many, many shows. Uh, I did take a, I said, I did take a vow when I started not to I always tell the truth. So I probably might not have gotten any of the shows anyway. I've been, or been fired from them, but you know, I, I'm just going to say, to be fair, I'm at a point in my life where 
I'm free from all that nonsense. So <laughs> I get away with it. Um, uh, Christine says, media people who have made a living out of spreading outrageous lies are generally not stupid. What they are is experts at self-deception. Pat keeps this in the note. Uh, there are two types of media people. Media people who are just being do, doing what they're told to do. For example, um, the woman who did the Oxygen Channel documentary about Martha Moxley. When I went in and sat in, I was in Baltimore when I did it. So I went up to Baltimore. We sat in this, this kind of like very cold place. My, it was really cool looking. But anyway, I'm sitting there in the chair. And when she started interviewing me, I just had a really bad feeling right away that I was going to be the fodder for, look at this silly person who says, Michael Skakel isn't guilty. And then Mark Friend was going to come in and say, yeah, of course he's guilty. And the host is going to agree. Well, basically that's what turned out to be. I was correct. Now, did the host really, really believe that? Or was she forced? In other words, we would like you to be at the host of this show, but we're, our, our point of the show is that Michael Skakel is guilty. This is what you're told. We're going to do a three-part show. And it's going to be, in the end, we're going to come up with Michael Skakel is guilty. We're going to bring in different people with opposing views. We're going to, we're going to investigate them all. But in the end, Michael Skakel is guilty. I think that may be what happened. Now, you have two choices at that point. You can say, I won't do this. I'm not going to just do an agenda. I'm going to analyze the information as it comes in. Uh, and, and I'm not going to, I refuse to just do an agenda. Or you can say, gee, I really like the money and being host of this show. <laughs> and so I'm going to do it. I don't know what the host of this particular show, what her motive was, what she was under, or what she believed. She may truly believe Michael Skakel's guilty. I don't know. Um, I'm just saying, I know how things work. And uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, very tricky. Oh, this is very nice. We need to help Pat's channel grow. We need more logic and reason, not only in true crime commentary, but in the world overall. We're in a crisis. Yeah, I don't think we are. Um, logic seems to have vanished. Um, and also the ability to discuss things with different points of view. I, I just I just had this guy up here who, you know, he um, saw my making a murder vi video or watched 10 minutes of it, whichever one. And he immediately said, you know, I think Stephen Avery is innocent, blah, blah, blah. And he starts attacking me, you know, in, in, in a friendly way. Um, and I, I try to be very civil to people who disagree as long as they're not rude. Um, but and that's the tricky part. It's like you can have a different opinion. You, you know, you can come to my channel. And if you listen to what I have to say and you still think, where is he? There he is. <laughs> if you still think Michael Skakel is guilty as charged in spite of everything I say, you have that right. I don't hate you. I wish you would, I wish you understood what I was saying, but I don't hate you. It's, it's your, your viewpoint. Um, and I respect that. And I hope that anybody comes here, you know, even if they don't agree with me, can you learn something from this and can we learn from other people? And, and, you know, I do learn from other channels that I don't feel are egregious in what they present. We need more logic. We need more ability to communicate. We need more ability to discuss the actual evidence without, and this is what I see happen a lot of times. It's like, I'm going to set you up. I'm going to I pretend I'm asking about the evidence, but I'm just really ready to get you. And, and that doesn't solve a lot of problems because, you know, really what you're doing is trying to, trying to prove that you were right to begin with. And that doesn't, that doesn't help. Um, let's see what Julia has to say. I love getting solid blocks of information from you instead of carefully chosen sound bites. Who would believe a case Mark Furman put together? Well, you know, you know, I'm, I say I'm not a big fan, um, but you know, He's not a big fan of me either. <laughs> he might do a show next week. It says, Pat Brown is a complete idiot. You know, um, I'm not saying that Mark Furman hasn't done good work in his life. I just, I just found this book particularly egregious because I found the crime was painted on Michael Skakel. And I believe the reason it painted on Michael Skakel is because that's what makes money. Um, that's what I believe. And the fact that so many simple points were left out either you just couldn't figure that out like couldn't you figure that out or you purposely left them out i don't know which one i don't know which one it is um chris claire says exactly talk about the actual evidence and not wild speculation this is one of the huge problems we're running into wild speculation oh my god the sutton report i don't know why nobody talks about the horrendous sutton report massive 
wild. I mean, you know, they were working for the skate girls, but I've never seen so much wild speculation in my life. If you ever get a chance, read that report. Oh my God. I mean, these guys, Mr. Skakel spent a fortune trying to, to do the right thing, to get the information he felt he could, that would either exonerate his sons or maybe, as I prove that one of them did it and needed to deal with it. And he hired people that went into the most massive wild speculation I've ever seen. And it's like, holy God almighty, there's, there's nothing. This isn't about evidence. This is about you coming up with every theory that you can throw at a wall and saying, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. What the hell? I mean, I'm sorry. I was appalled. I was absolutely appalled. I, I didn't know it was that bad until I recently read it. I'm like, wow, go figure. Uh, that's a frightening. That's frightening. That is frightening. Absolutely frightening. Let me look back and see if there's anything else here. Um, <laughs> oh, let's see. I'm going, I'm going backwards now just to, just to check. Oh, I don't know if you're talking about Littleton, but yeah, Littleton is, is a whack job. Um, Littleton has as a as a massive history of of anger, hostility, does all kinds of weird crap. Um, is he a psychopath or is does he have some other kind of personality disorder or psychosis? I don't know. But it dude's not normal. Oh, oh, this is interesting. They tried to pin the entirety of his life after Martha Moxley, as if the Martha Moxley case was one that propelled him into it. <laughs> you know, no, he was already lying and already deceptive during the actual original questioning. Um, you know, you don't just develop, he's 23 years old. At 23 years old, just because you have a bad experience doesn't mean you turn into a psychotic overnight and start attacking people and, and doing and committing burglaries. And, and, you know, you don't do that. I mean, you know, that that's, that's nonsense. If you, you actually think that's true. I mean, you know, you, it's, it's just not, I mean, if you have a personality disorder, your personality disorder has been there for years and I'm going to, nobody's ever really looked back into, um, which is interesting. Nobody's ever looked back into Littleton before he arrived uh, into the Skakel household. I would, you know, I've never seen anything on it. I would like to know what the heck kind of dude was he? Now they'll say he was a handsome guy. Okay. Really? That, that's your whole, that's your whole perception on because he played football and rugby and he was a handsome guy. He was perfectly healthy and normal to the moment he ran to the Skakels. And the Skakels did him in because they're rich people. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you know, I could run into a bad situation tomorrow. I'm going to assure you that you're not going to find me breaking into somebody's house and laying on a dude naked. <laughs> hmm, let me think about it. Okay, it is a cute dude. Okay, but I'm not going to be doing that, nor am I going to be burglarizing places, starting fights, uh, stealing stuff. I'm not, you know, that's not going to happen. I may get depressed, but I'm not going to suddenly exhibit massive personality disorders. Now they say he's bipolar, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, somehow it excuses him from the possibility he could have committed a murder. I don't understand that. It makes absolutely no sense. So, but you know, for some reason they want it painted on Michael Skakel and you know, nobody seems to have any sympathy for Michael Skakel. And I find that kind of sad because you think about it, you know, that poor dude, if he's innocent, if he's truly innocent of killing Martha Moxley, 11 years in prison, he didn't get to, he had a, he had a, he had a son a newborn son. He went to prison and couldn't spend 11 years with his, with his son. He had to spend 11 years in a, in a prison and nobody feels sorry for him. If he's not guilty. Why, why? No. Hey, you know, you want, people want Stephen Avery who burned up his, who tortured him, burned up his own cat, <laughs> who was a psychopath of the nth degree, who, who all the evidence points to that he raped and murdered a woman and burnt her up in the fire pit in his backyard. They, they feel sympathy for that piece of crap and want him to be free. But Michael Skakel, they hate. I, I don't get it. I, I honestly do not get it. I mean, I think that's just uh, pretty sad. Um, oh, look at that. Levi was here. Hi, Levi. <laughs> I didn't see you come in because I can't see the comments when I'm doing all the other stuff. But glad to have you here, Levi. Levi has been a friend of mine for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and he, he does some great stuff. So I just, uh, <laughs> Gene says, going to have to watch over missed 45 minutes. Hey, that's why it's, it's taped, you know? Um, yeah, you know, I love the fact I can do live because it's just real. And I, you know, you know, it's not edited. <laughs> and when you do, when you do a show and you can edit everything, then you can say, Oh, she was very careful what she said. 
you got what, whatever I said, I said it, you know. So I love the fact that it is live, but of course it is rebroadcast. So thank God. Um, and yeah, for every young, wasn't that Littleton's first or second day at the Skakel house? Yes, but it doesn't mean he also, there was some talk about him visiting prior to that. But hey, you know, I hate to tell you this, but you know, a serial killer or a serial rapist or anybody who's crazy, um, how long do you have to be someplace? before you can follow a girl with a golf club and hit her over the head. Not very long. No, he doesn't even need to know. He can just see Martha think, dang. And he might have been watching in the bushes as she was messing around, you know, and thinking, well,